Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to Journey of Faith. I'm Jason Cusick. I'm the lead pastor here at the church. And I want to say a special welcome if you're here with us for the first time. Maybe you visited with us on Easter, and this is your first time back after that. Or you might be here with us for the very first time ever. So glad that you're with us. I want to say hi to everybody that's online and uh, hi to everybody in our, in our balcony up there. Uh, we, uh, this is the message, message portion of our service. This will take us through the end of the service. And last week we started a three-week series called Relationship Goals. It's all about how to improve relationships in our life. We all want to have great relationships. Jesus lets us know where to start. Someone came up to Jesus one time and said, what's, what's the greatest commandment in all of the Bible? And here's how he answered. He said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And, and a second is equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. So we actually see three relationships in these two commandments, a relationship with God, a relationship with our neighbor, and a relationship with our own selves. Last week, we talked about that first one, relationship with God. We looked at a, a story, a parable from Jesus where he compared our hearts to different kinds of soil. And the idea was, if we want to have a relationship with God, we should have soft hearts, soft soil uh, in our lives. And, and then we can allow God to work in our lives and we can see great results. So if you missed that message or would like to look at it again, you can go uh, online on our YouTube channel or on our website and check that out. Today we're talking about the second relationship in our lives, our relationship with our neighbor. Now when we use that word here in the United States, like right now, neighbor refers to someone that lives on your street or down the street from you, or around the corner. But in Jesus' day, neighbor referred to anyone that was close to you, family, friends, co-workers, um, students at school that you go to school with, and especially those people that are close to you that might be going through something where they need some support. So really when we say relationship with your neighbor, maybe we could change that word neighbor to a relationship with your people. Who are your people? Your friends, your, your family, the people that you're connected with. And maybe you can be thinking about one or two of the relationships in your life that could be benefited from, from some intentionality on your part to love your neighbor as yourself, who might that person, one or two relationships be? And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. One of the most important relationships in my life is the relationship with my wife. This summer, my wife and I will be married 30 years, uh, which is really, thank you, really hard to comprehend. We, we, we married young. We made a lot of mistakes. We've had a lot of ups and downs, and we're very different. Uh, from each other, my wife and I. Here's a picture of my wife and I at our 25th anniversary. This was, we were in Scotland, and this is uh, N.T. Wright. He's an English theologian, former bishop. He teaches at Oxford. And he um, renewed our vows while we were in Scotland. For those of you that are theologically minded, this is a serious theological flex on my part to show this picture. So it's pretty exciting. Um, but I'm always, my wife and I are very different. My wife is um, what you would call third culture. Some of you are that, where you maybe have two cultures represented in your home. My, my wife's uh, dad is from the States. Mom is from Vietnam. And so she grew up kind of balancing two cultures. So I'm always trying to find ways to connect with her in the culture that's different than mine, and that is her Vietnamese culture. So I was on TikTok uh, a couple months ago, and, I, and there's a woman that teaches Vietnamese phrases. And Vietnamese is very difficult to learn later in life. It's a tonal language. It's very challenging. But I've been trying to learn some simple phrases. So she said, if you really want to connect with your wife, you should say this phrase to her. And she said it, and I was like, ooh, that's tough. So I played it over and over, and I, I, I figured out how to do it. And I even wrote it out phonetically for myself. And I was like, okay, here's how you say it. And then one day I came home, and I walked up to her, and I said it. And she said, what did you say? And, and I was like, oh, did I say it right? So I checked my phonetic pronunciation and I, and I said it again. And she said, what do you mean I stink? And I was like, oh, I got pranked. 
by this person on TikTok, you know? And now my wife is really nice, so she assumed the best of me. She grew up, when she left Vietnam, she was young. And so she thought, well, maybe it's like a, a term of endearment, like my little stinky or something like that. She was like, maybe it's lost in translation, it's fine or something. But here's what I didn't tell you, and it made it worse. Before I said that, I came in and I greeted her, and I, I gave her a, a Vietnamese kiss, which is just a sign of affection, where you go up to somebody, instead of kissing their cheek, you sniff it. So you see what I did? <laughs> you stink. I mean, so anyway, big picture. The goal is if you want to improve a relationship with your life, tell the person that they stink. That's what you should do. Here's the real point. <laughs> if you want to have great relationships, you have to be intentional. We grew intentionally through that. It is a joke. It's now a story that we can tell. But if you're not intentional about relationships, they will succumb to entropy. They will just stagnate and they will die. God wants us to have great relationships, which means we have to be intentional. Here's the main idea for today. We can be intentional in strengthening our relationships. Let's see what Jesus, some wisdom that Jesus offers us about this. Here's where we can find it in the New Testament of the Bible, Matthew chapter 25. This is the first book of the New Testament. It's named after Matthew, who was one of Jesus' disciples. If you get a chance to read this whole section on your own this week, this would be really great. Um, if you want to look it up in your Bible now, this is where you can find it. If you don't have a Bible, we have these starter Bibles. When you uh, head out of the service today, we would love for you to have a Bible. If you don't have a print-bound Bible in your possession, we want to give you one. We'll even show you where this is. There's something powerful about learning how to navigate this book, and we'll be talking about it in, in a few months in particular, to be able to navigate this book, to be able to understand the whole story of the Bible, and it helps when you're in groups and when you're in services here because this is what we teach from. And to be able to go to it and not only grow on your own, but be able to check us to make sure we're teaching this and we're not doing our own kind of uh, weird hocus pocus on it. So Matthew chapter 25, what we're going to read today. And what we're going to read here, this is actually kind of a, a, a vision that Jesus had of himself coming back to earth in the future and judging the world. And the way he judges the world has a very specific focus on relationships. So when we read this, you're going to see Jesus refers to himself as the son of man and king. So when you run across those, he's talking about himself. Here's what he says. When the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he'll sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence and he'll separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He'll place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left, like, like the good and the bad. And then the king will say to those on his right, come, all you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you? Jesus, when were you thirsty? And, 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 and when did we give you something to drink? When were you a stranger and we showed you hospitality? Or naked? and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the King Jesus will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. And then the king will turn to those on the left and say, away with you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. For I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger, you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked, 
You didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't visit me. And then they will reply, Lord, did we ever see you? When did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? And he will answer, I tell you the truth. When you refused to help the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you were refusing to help me. Ouch. Man, that's hardcore stuff. Now, what is Jesus saying? Now, we believe what Jesus is specifically talking about is in the future, Jesus will judge how people received his 12 disciples as they went out into their mission field. And we know that this is probably the case because earlier in Matthew's writing, Jesus sends out his disciples and he says, now go and don't take any food, don't take any extra clothing, and I'm not gonna tell you where to stay. When you go to a place, you'll be a stranger and someone will take you in and they'll provide you food and they'll give you a change of clothing, you'll be okay. But some people, they will hate you, they'll reject you and they'll even throw you into jail. So it seems like Jesus in the future is really judging how his 12 disciples will be received. But big picture, Jesus is talking about how all of us relate to people right around us that have needs that are struggling and how important that is to Jesus. Now, what Jesus was describing here, the importance of love and hospitality, meeting needs, was actually nothing new. Jewish culture talked about this all the time. Many of the cultures of Jesus's day talked about the importance of hospitality and love and meeting needs. But Jesus really puts an emphasis on this and it's one of those ways that we can strengthen relationships. And not we don't have to think, how can I go to some foreign place to help hungry people? How can I go to some faraway place and help these people? There are needs right around us. What we have to do is say, God, am I aware of these? And that's the first way we can strengthen relationships in our lives. Ask God to help you be aware of the needs right around you. Are you paying attention? Are we watching? Some of you, there are people that you know that are in a hospital right now. Have you visited them? There's people that you know who they or their family members are in a subacute care facility or a rehab facility or uh, they're homebound and nobody's visiting them. And you can do it. You can stop by and just visit. Some of you know some people who are incarcerated and you can go visit them. Some of you know people in your area, they're going through a really tough time and you can bring them a meal. Do some people in your area need clothing? I can tell you when when my kids were little, uh, when they were real little, they were going through clothing a lot. You know, little kids are growing quick. So we we had a friend, uh, another couple who had kids that were just older than us and they kept giving us their kids clothes after they grew out of them. There's people around us that have basic needs that we can reach out and meet. And not just those, there's other uh, desires that people have that we can help with. This is a great book that I read years ago, uh, The Seven Desires of Every Heart. And in this book, the authors give seven things that we can probably all relate to. Let me read them to you. And you might be like, oh, I can relate to that. But I want you to think, is there a person or two in your life that maybe has one of these needs that you can connect with? Here's the first one, to be heard and understood. So when somebody wants to, they just went through something. They're going through something right now and you can just listen. And not listen to answer, just listen to understand. Maybe somebody has a different belief than you and they wanna share it with you. You don't have to listen to debate, you can just listen to understand where they're coming from. And you know what a great response when somebody is talking, a uh, great response to have? You can just say this, tell me more about that. Man, doesn't that feel good? When you have something you want to share and somebody goes, oh, tell me more. You're like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Here's another one. To be affirmed. This is when somebody is doing something good and you actually tell them, you know, you're really good at that. Who is somebody right around you, a relationship that you could work on among your people that they do something good and you can go, man, you're really good at that thing. You're watching and you notice it. You might think, well, they already know they're good at it. Yeah, but you can tell them. The author says there's another one. He says to be blessed. And what he, the, the 
the difference that he says here is this one is when you affirm them for something they do. This is when you affirm them for who they are. When you think about it, some of us grew up in cultures where the only time we were praised is when we did something. And that got us into that performance thing. I have to do something because if I do more things, people are proud of me. What if it's, hey, I just want to let you know I love you just the way you are. This is especially good when somebody feels like they failed at something. You don't have to say, oh, you could do that better. You could say, you know what? I really love you. I really appreciate you. I'm like, wait, didn't you just see what I just did? (laughs) Yeah, I know. Here's another one. To be safe. People want to feel safe nowadays. You know how we can do that? When somebody is sharing a view and you can tell that maybe they're hesitant about being judged, you don't judge them. You just listen. We need relationships that are safe. This also means we know how to be confidential and we don't talk about people behind their back. Here's another one, to be touched. Now what we mean in culture is this is non-sexual touch. You know there's people in your life that have not been physically touched for years? What does it mean to come alongside and Touch a hand, put a hand on a mat, maybe give a hug. Now, these are consensual things. Not everybody appreciates such. When I first became a Christian, I had to get used to the fact that Christians hug each other. I'm like, I wasn't used to that. I walk into church, they'd be like, bring it in. I'd be like, I'm not, no, thank you. I'm not. <laughs> Gotten used to it now, a little bit better. Um, but to connect with somebody, I have a friend of mine, he lost his wife several years ago. He gets handshakes. So we hug. And he's like, man, it's been a long time since I've hugged somebody. If you're in a God-honoring relationship, sexual touch is meaningful. God doesn't intend long-term, romantic, God-honoring relationships to be sexless. That's part of what it means to connect and encourage that relationship. There's two more. One of them is to be chosen. That's where they, hey, I got a project at work. Would you be a part of this? Hey, we've got this thing we're gonna go do. Would you come with us? Hey, do you wanna get together on this night? We're gonna go do this thing. Man, everybody wants to feel, I wanna be chosen. And then there's the other one. The other side of that is to be included. Maybe I'm not asking you to be part of this project, but you're still part of the team. Hey, I'm not, you're not on this thing, but we're still part of a family here. Are there people in your life, your people, people close to you, that would benefit from you helping to connect and meet one of these needs? Here's an action step, a relationship goal here. Let God's love motivate you to meet someone's need this week. And I say let God's love motivate you because sometimes we're motivated by other things. We might be motivated by people pleasing. Like, I wanna meet this person's needs so they will be happy with me. Or we're motivated by guilt. I I should meet this person's need because I haven't met that need in a long time. Well, that's more about you. It's not about them. Or we say, I want to meet that person's need for appearances because I I want to be shown to be a person that meets needs. That's when you go out and you do something wonderful and then you take a selfie while you're doing the wonderful thing and you post it online. It's like, don't do that. Keep it secret. Meet a need and actually don't tell anybody about it. What does it look like when we do that. Well, last week we, we gave some examples of what a relationship with God could look like based on this letter that we have in the New Testament called Ephesians. It was written to a group of people that lived in a place called Ephesus, which is in modern day Turkey. And it was first century Christians who gave us some examples of what this looked like. Let's go back to that letter in the part of the New Testament, the letter to the Ephesians. So here's some examples of what uh, being intentional about relationships would look like in a in a, uh, a home setting or in among your people. So it starts off by saying, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's good for all of us with each other, regardless of gender, regardless of marital status, regardless of income level. This is us saying, I respect Jesus enough to serve you. And then you respect Jesus enough to serve me. It's just like this m- Mutual submission, and that's good for all of us, of friends, as you're relating to people in your community. Now, if you're married, 
it goes on and it says this. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. I spoke to a woman about this about six months ago and I said, she was talking about her relationship with her husband and I said, what does the Bible say for you to do as a wife? And she said, well, the Bible says I should submit to my husband as to the Lord. Jesus submitted to the Father, so I should submit to my husband. And I said, and what should the husband do? And she said, well, the husband should love his wife just as Christ loved the church. So my husband should die. And I was like, that was funny. That was a good one. I was like, that's a good bit. I'm gonna say that again. But, but I was like, yeah, that's actually pretty good. Because what, what it's saying is there's this mutual self-sacrifice. Right, in the marriage relationship, it's not 50%, 50%, it's 100%, 100%. You're kind of beating yourself to the bottom is what you're trying to do. And then uh, parents and kids, right? It says, children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. And then it says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Now this says fathers, I actually think it includes parents. Some of you moms are like, hey, it says fathers, let's stick to the word, you know? Um, but the idea is, uh, uh, the children are supposed to, uh, younger children are supposed to say, look, I'm gonna do my best to submit to my parents as part of what it means to live the spiritual life with Jesus. But then parents, our job is not to make it difficult for our kids. Some of us are overbearing. Some of us exasperate our children and then we make it harder for them to follow Jesus. So again, it's that mutuality that comes out. And then uh, the, if you read further into this, it talks about the relationship between slaves and their masters. And that's, it's not the chattel slavery that we talk about like in the United States that we experience. In the first century world, a, a family inclu- included mom, dad, maybe some aunts and uncles, the children, and then there were domestic servants that were part of the home. They were considered part of the family. It would have been maids and servants. It, it, here in this area, it might be like au pairs and nannies and people that work, you know, that we hire. And the idea is the people that we hire serve us. And then those of us who are hired, we serve them. And there's that mutuality that comes from that. And when you think about it, the relationships we just looked at, they're really centered around differences. The husband and the wife are different. The child and the parent are different. The master and the slave are different. And they have to navigate those relationships. And maybe that's the hardest part is it's easy to love people who are similar to us. It's harder to love people who are different than us, who think different, who, who process information different, who have different uh, uh, ways of thinking. They, they vote differently. It's harder to have those relationships. Even if we go back to the story of Jesus' vision of judging the end of the world, Jesus was saying, if you are housed, you help the unhoused people. If you are well-fed, you help the people who are not well-fed. If you are able and healthy and able to get out of your home, you go serve the people who are not able to get out of the situations that they are in which shows us kind of the second way that we can be intentional in strengthening our relationships, and it's this. See differences as invitations, not barriers. See, I still have this romantic notion in my mind that the longer I am in a relationship with somebody, the more similar we will be. And that's not true. That's not actually how relationships work. We might find some shared meaning, but being in a relationship with someone, a healthy relationship doesn't cause us to become more similar. You understand what I mean? That's like, we need to think differently about that. Let me give you an example. So there's a a researcher by the name of John Gottman, and John Gottman did some of the, the research on, the long, on long-term relationships. He studied relation, long-term relationships for over a decade. He's written stuff on marriage and parenting and um, uh, amazing stuff. And as he studied long-term relationships, he said 
that there is a percentage of problems in your relationships that are solvable. That is, oh, we have a problem. Let's talk about it. And then we'll work with each other and we will come up with a solution and then that won't be a problem anymore. Can you guess what that percentage is? I mean, is it 100% of problems are solvable? 90%? 80%? 50%? Get a number in your head right now. What percentage of problems in relationships are solvable? Here's what he came up with. 33% are solvable. Which means 67% are unsolvable. <laughs> like, this is, problems in your relationships. Over half of the problems you have are unsolvable. Now, a good part is he rebranded that phrase. And what he called them was 64% are manageable. And they're manageable. They're not solvable because they're rooted in your personality. In your life experience. It's who you are. You're different than other people. So you're not going to be able to fix those differences, and you shouldn't. They should be invitations toward better understanding. So here's another relationship goal for you. Here's an action step. Set one realistic goal to improve one important relationship in your life. One realistic goal for one relationship. Who is it? Is it your relationship with your boss? An employee? A spouse, one of your kids, your parent, co-worker, friend at school. And make it realistic. And it's based on you. What can you do? Not if they would change, we would have a better relationship, right? It's what you can do. Let me give you an example of what this would look like. Um, Let's go back to that letter in the New Testament written to the Ephesians. And I'm just going to read through some examples of how those first Christians thought about improving their relationships. And as I read them through, I just want you to go, yeah, that's mine, or yeah, that registers with me. That's a good one. And I'll just leave a little pause in case it relates to you. I've got commentary for all of these, but I'm just gonna let you kind of sit with what resonates with you. Okay, here's what it says. Let us tell our neighbors the truth. Don't sin by letting anger control you. Use your hands for good, hard work. And then give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Get rid of all bitterness. Get rid of all rage. Get rid of all harsh words. Get rid of all slander. And then here's a bigger one, as well as all types of evil behavior. In case any of those didn't register, they're like, and then everything else. And then, and then what do we replace it with? This is how he ends. He says, instead, be kind to each other. Tender-hearted. Forgiving one another just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Any of those resonate with you? Are you making some notes? And I don't mean for you, I don't mean nudging the person next to you, and I saw a few people do that, okay? (laughs) So I saw you, don't do that. Say, no, this is what I need to work on. Let me tell you the one I'm personally working on. It's the first one up here. Let us tell our neighbors the truth. I, um, I, I'm, timid, I deal with anxiety, I'm a people pleaser, I'm trying to recover from that. So as a result, sometimes I'm 
I'm not as direct with people. Like they ask for my input and, and sometimes I don't give it. I'm nervous about how they'll receive it. I don't wanna be perceived the wrong way. So I'll, I'll hold it back, I won't tell them the truth. And so I'm working on that to be more direct and more assertive. For some of you, it's not your problem. You're very blunt, you're very truth, you know. You need to work on that. You're a little bit too intense. But I need to work on just being more truthful. So again, um, the action step here, uh, what, what's a, a realistic goal? What's a realistic goal? Who is that goal for you intended to improve the relationship on? What will you do or stop doing? How will you know if you accomplish the goal? Those of you who know about SMART goals, how could you turn this into a SMART goal where you could, two months later, you could go, this relationship is a lot better. And somebody says, how? And you'd be like, well, here's what I started doing. Or that person could tell you, hey, how's our relationship? Well, our relationship's a lot better. Why would you say that? You're not as harsh anymore. You speak more truthfully. The words that you say are encouraging. You've stopped slandering me. Here's what we talked about today. We can be intentional in strengthening our relationships. How? Be aware of the needs right around you. Say, God, open my eyes. Help me to see this. And then see differences as invitations, not barriers. This is really important for this year in particular as we're in this election year. Seeing differences as invitations, not as barriers. We have a world that's incredibly divided. And it's only getting more divided. We need to be intentional and let's, lead, let's us lead the way in what it looks like to strengthen relationships, especially with people who are different and especially with people that we might even brand as our enemies. Now, let me point out one thing at the end. Remember when I said when Jesus was giving that vision of him judging the world and it was about helping the people that don't have anywhere to live and the hungry and the sick and the lonely and stuff like that. And I said, this, this was not new to Jesus. This was part of Jewish culture. This was part of many of the cultures in the first century. High hospitality, high support, high love. There was something that Jesus said in that that was very unique to him. And I, uh, hopefully you caught it. Here's what he said. I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you were doing it to me. That's the added element that Jesus brings. What Jesus is saying is, when we care for, love, and are intentional in strengthening the relationships in our lives, we are in some spiritual, mystical, powerful way strengthening our relationship with God himself. And as we are strengthening our relationship with God, God will naturally lead us to be intentional about strengthening the relationships with the people around us. In fact, Jesus said at one point, people will know that the Father sent me by how we all love each other. That's the evidence. We wanna convince a world that Jesus is real Let's have great relationships because that will be the most compelling truth that we can share. Let me pray for us about how we can do that. Would you stand as we close our service here today? If you want a Bible, pick one up on the way out. If you want to know more about getting involved, if there's something you'd like prayer about, maybe one of the things that I brought up was like, oh man, that's really tough in my life. We'd love to hear about it and pray for you, pray with you. We'll have our prayer team right over here by this cross. And then um, join us next week. We're gonna talk about that, uh, that last, that third important relationship, our relationship with our own selves. What does that look like? Um, so join us for that. Let me pray for us as we close. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you that you don't only care about us, you, you care about everyone else and you've, you've invited us and commissioned us, even commanded us to go show that same kind of love we would want to experience, you're telling us to pass that on to others. Thank you for the opportunities right around us. And give us that intentionality, that specificity, 
and help us to see the great result that can come from that. And, and as we see that, we'll give you credit for it. And we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, everybody. Have a great week.